Are you ready, ready, ready? Ring a ding a ding ding. I used to have a song uh, by Godfrey Brittle, his name was, which is called Are You Ready, Ready, Ready? I got to get that song and play it for you sometime. It's powerful. Are you ready? Because today's show is going to really rock. Uh, I have an interview with Jason Matera. Jason, a three time New York Times bestselling author, and he hits the subjects no one else wants to talk about. And that's the reason why you need to be hearing from him. Moral case for embracing polarization. There's a Bible verse, and it's from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 34. It says, certain people out of weakness were made strong, and they became valiant in the fight. How many of you are about to become valiant and strong because you're embracing the battle in America? Instead of being weak, you're going to be strong. By the way, I, uh, I've been asking my staff, where is the vital organ stuff? I just did a podcast with Dr. Jordan Rubin. Jordan Rubin is a genius. I call him like the Jewish Edison of organics. He said that, you know, uh, if you want a better liver, you eat liver. If you want a better heart, you eat heart. You want better kidneys, you eat kidneys. He said it's amazing the correlation between body parts in the animals and they're bought in the body part of a human. He said, but nobody wants to eat that stuff. They don't like it. So he put it together in a special blend called Organs Blend. It's not, not that not, I wouldn't say it's the tastiest branding, but that's better because he has a limited supply and I'm getting them now for me. You want to get Organs Blend, ancientnutrition.com forward slash Lance. And then the women came out and just had my producers come out and go, hey, the women's vitality product is wild. They're all, all my team experiments with this stuff. Well, I've got, I've got more energy, more clarity. It's just women's vitality, ancientnutrition.com forward slash Lance. And then you use Lance VIP, you get 20% off. Did I tell you that? I forgot to tell you. Lance VIP gets you 20% off. Let me know what's going on out there. We're doing market research all the time. Ancient Nutrition. Dot com forward slash Lance, use the code Lance VIP, save 20%, and wax valiant in the fight. Let's get into today's show. Every now and then I, I get to bring in a, an expert. I mean, when I when I say expert, I mean somebody who has mastery in a certain area that you need to know about. And the person I'm bringing in from the from his early teens, even in his 20s, was uh, a college uh, phenomena in pushing back on the left and learning how to embrace the battle and have fun in the conflict. He's the author of three best-selling New York Times books, uh, but I don't want to waste another moment because I really think uh, my goal is to get Jason Matera a show similar to mine so that this next generation of uh, voices, Mark Levins and Glenn Becks, and as we're aging out, we can bring these guys up. Jason, please join us. Good hey, see- Lance, thanks for having me on. Good to see you, young man. So anyway, you got me all excited. I was, uh, you know, I wake up in the morning and, and I, I want to be like, you know, uh, kind of like positive, but I'll read some of my friends, you know, letters or articles, and you're one of them. And you got me going today. The moral case for embracing polarization. We're living in a day when everybody is bending over backwards in the evangelical church. It's, it's, I, I think it's the high church evangelical thing came from New York with, uh, who's the, you know, who's the famous New York evangelical pastor there that just passed away? You know who I'm talking about. Tim Keller. Tim Keller. Tim Keller. Then the Rick yeah. Warrens. Mm-hmm. And, and these guys are like, we've looked up to them for so long as the model of Billy Graham-like statesman Christianity that when they go off, boy, do they take you on a ride, and they go off for all the noblest reasons, uh, mainly being peace-loving, staying out of politics, being able to get along with your neighbor. God loves everyone. Don't you know he loves the Democrats and the Republicans equally? Yeah, yeah. And so you're right away, the next thing you know, you're going down that trail. You're, you're, you're packing your bags. You're getting on the, uh, the train station. The Gestapo's herding you off to the uh, camp. And you realize, maybe I should have said something. So talk to us about this article here. And, and please make the argument that it is the biblical responsibility to stand up against evil and not try to find common ground so that you can win your friend, make friends out of us, someone who maybe you need to have a serious conversation with. Talk to us. Yeah, and we're all about making friends and and bringing about unity. We have all these crocodile tears in our culture, especially from those in the evangelical world. You mentioned some of the names. 
who are like, oh, can't we just, you know, can't we get just get along? And we have to stop this, they call it derisively, the culture war theology and stop breaking out in these political camps where one is the children of light and one is the children of darkness. And on and on it goes. We even had, as you talked about, those woke guy, uh, he gets us uh, ads during the Super Bowl and, and and say, Jesus didn't preach, you know, hate, he preached love. And we don't want to, politics has been used to inflame our cultural divisions. And we just want to bring people together and just speak about that message of Jesus and that message of unity. And it begs the question, is polarization, which is being bemoaned, always wrong? And I would say no. I would say there. Obviously, we want people to have a unity, but what are you uniting behind? And that's always the key question. If we're uniting behind a Christian consensus on how to direct the affairs of not just our government but our family and our churches and our communities, and sure, let's have unity, and we should invite people into it and explain or, or try to make our case and persuade people. But that's not what we have today. We have deep cultural divisions and political divisions for a very good reason. It's because the highest office in the land, Lance, as you know, is literally trying to trash America's youth. All right, all right, all right, so, all right let, let's, let, we're going to go there in a second, because I yep. think once we bring down some examples, like the story, like the one you tell about here in the article, mm -hmm. I, want you to, I want you to cover that. But I, I, I think it makes it very clear. But let me just go to a biblical verse here. Uh, well, I guess a Bible verse is biblical. So it's chapter 14 of the book of Acts. This this comes to my mind for those of you that want to, you, especially you preachers out there that occasionally eavesdrop on me. Now it happened in Iconium that we they went together. This is the, the, the Dr. Luke is writing about the Apostle Paul. And they went together into a synagogue and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. So much is in that verse that is typical of every era. There's always a group that is jealous that you're having influence on the populist movement or on the people. And so they aren't exploring the truth. They're out to poison the minds of the people you're reaching because they're losing power. And if they lose power, they're losing money. So they poison the mind, that's slander, that's media, that's false accusation, that's lawfare, that's what you've got happening today. Nothing's changed, but I want you to catch this verse. Therefore, Paul and his team stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord, who was bearing witness to that word of his grace, granting them supernatural attestation in signs and wonders done by their hands. Now watch this. But the multitude of the city was divided, part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. I want to point out something. When an apostolic generation has done its job, you don't bring the whole city into unity. You unite people around the truth who will be truthful, and you separate those that are anti-truth from the truth, and you've perfectly divided the Word of God when you perfectly divided the heart into camps that are for the truth or against the truth. The goal of apostolic Christianity in the Bible isn't a city united, it's a city divided for the right reasons. Yeah, the gospel is inherently divisive in that it demarcates right from wrong very clearly. And we shouldn't be surprised because it's all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, uh, where God's people were persecuted because they were standing up for truth. But you have these Christians today, they're like, oh, they love to throw out the word winsome. Oh, we got to be winsome. And I'm not saying to, in embracing polarization, you want to be a loud mouth jerk and belligerent and all of that. But what I am saying, and Christians and, and Christians who follow you and are our, our, our devoted listeners to your, to your your show and your podcast, let's know that we should be speaking out on social media and in churches and in city council meetings and in town halls. And yet there are a number of these uh, so-called Christian leaders out there with big platforms who are trying to discourage Christian activism and engagement in the public sector because they say, well, it's not, it's not winsome or it's not uniting or it's going to deepen our cultural divisions. And they want us, and it, what that is, is just uh, a a euphemism for giving up. They just want to give up. I, we should start calling them cowards for Christ, because that's what they are. <laughs> they are cowards. It is a misrepresentation. The good shepherd is what? It's supposed to protect his sheep from 
the wolves. And yet here we have the 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 the, 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 the cowardly shepherd who is just not only not protecting the sheep from the wolves, but is leading them to a wolf's den. And 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 it's okay to go ahead and speak the truth and worry about the consequences. And not only just in, in biblical history, but just in recent history, we have men like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right, who was literally plotting to assassinate Hitler. He was talking about uh, uh, now a Jewish persecution at the hands of the Nazis. Should he not have done that because it wasn't winsome and he may have offended the sensibilities of his Nazi neighbors or William Wilberforce? I mean, he certainly had settled the plantation owners and the feelings of the, the, the merchants when he talked about banning the, the Atlantic slave trade. Should he not have done that because it was polarizing, which it definitely was in that time, or Martin Luther King? His movements cried for civil rights. Should he not have done it? Because, you know, all those uh, people were kind of getting used to Jim Crow and they they liked the different water factions for, for whites and blacks and the different schools for whites and blacks. And, and uh, they, he shouldn't have uh, really rocked the boat in that matter because it wasn't winsome. It was, it was polarizing for his time. And the point is the gospel is polarizing because it's a moral claim, as you know, for the entirety of society. And that was so maddening with these Christian, you know, Christian leaders who, sh- who, who should know better. They should know better, but they don't want to get so needy in, All right, in, we're, in politics because we don't have the right candidates. Or, All right. You know, it's a little dirty and messy. Jason, we have, uh, because we got limited time, we got two minutes and 40 seconds here in this segment, but I want to, I want to start this off with Michigan because Michigan's one of the swing states, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, and uh, Arizona and Georgia. We're going to be working extensively. I'm going into every one of those swing states with as many um, influencers as possible to try to do a thing called the Courage Tour because believers need to stand up. If we don't have, if we don't show up, the nation is, is going to go down. That's why this conversation with you is so important. Those of you that are listening, by the way, you can go to thecouragetour.com, find out when we're coming to a city near you. We're going to be bringing a, a whole boatload of, uh, of, of, on fire people and 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 listen jason i think i need to get you involved with with one of these two and i'll tell you why the michigan school district particularly has a story that we need to hit explain to folks what's going on in michigan yeah it's the east rockford middle school district and it's a case that's now being litigated by our friends at the alliance defending freedom and the the basic details of the case is a couple's daughter was struggling academically, emotionally, two years ago, and the school, and she's been going to the school since kindergarten, so they were familiar with the staff, with the teachers, the psychologists, and said, hey, our daughter's not doing well. It turns out she was, she was diagnosed with autism, and she was seeing a therapist at the school. During these therapy sessions, she allegedly expressed signs of gender dysphoria, and rather than relay this critical information back to the, the parents, what the school did is they hid it from the parents. Then they started referring to the girl, she was in sixth grade, I think at the time, as a, a boy. They changed her, her gay, gave her a masculine masculine name, started to change her pronouns on all school records. And then when they would send information home back to the parents, they made they, they made it seem like nothing was amiss. They, they put the girl's real name, her real pronouns. So they're basically trying to transition this girl behind the parents back, giving her graphic, you know, gay stuff to read, talking about chest binders, you know, her female body is developing, uh, but trying to transition this girl behind the parents back. The parents find out because a psychologist accidentally sends the wrong information back home to this, this, the parents, referring to the girl as a boy. The parents say, hey, listen, you got to, like, they're firmly, you got you, you to refer to our girl as a girl and not a boy. The, pa- the, the school refuses. They say, well, no, your 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 uh, daughter's uh, wishes here trump your parental rights. So they yank the girl from the school. They are suing out the school district. But it's emblematic of what we're dealing with across America with government schools, especially in these these uh, uh, not not just uh, I mean, you find them even in red districts too. So it's not just a red or blue. Yeah, yeah. Thing. And, and, and so, government. Jason, I want you to hold that thought. We're going to take a yeah. quick break, and we're going to come right back. You don't want to miss this because this is happening in your school. Also, we'll be right back. I wanted to take a minute to talk about one of my great heroes of the faith, which is Mike Lindell. What's really cool about Mike is it's not just the pillow; it's the fact that the guy makes really cool products. For instance. I start my day off with a my coffee. I had a cup of coffee uh, the other day here in the office and I said, no, I want that. It wasn't like Starbucks, it tastes better. 
and it was Mike's coffee. I said, what is it? They go, Mike Lindell's coffee. I said, my gosh, get a bunch of my coffees. Now, the best way to start the day is you put on these slippers, right? And have your my coffee. If you've not worked with these slippers yet, I'm not kidding you. There's a special kind of a design that Mike has uh, put into these with four layers of cushion with a solid sole and a fur interior. I call it my sip and slip strategy. I start my day off by slipping on my slippers and having a sip of Mike's coffee. But you know what else I'm curious about now? Because I've got to check out the 2.0 pillow. The 2.0 pillow actually is designed so that it distributes the heat of your own head, your face, you know, you're lying there. And it, it uh, makes it so the pillow's always cool. Now, I like that, because I wake up in the middle of the night and have to flip over my pillow because it gets hot. Mike's solved that problem. I want you to go to mypillow.com, promo code Lance, because you can get a discount that I've set up for the pillows, for the coffee, and uh, for the slippers. And do it today, you'll be happy. All right, so we're back with Jason Matera, who's written a powerful article. By the way, I want you all to get it. The Moral Case for Embracing Polarization. By the way, where can they get your articles, Jason? How can they follow you? They can uh, get it at standingforfreedom.com. I write for a uh, Liberty University. It's one of their publications. Or they can just follow me on social media, Jason Matera, the handle on Instagram or Twitter or or Facebook or Jason Matera, you know, where, okay. where they get it. And that's M-A-T-T-E-R-A, Jason Matera on Instagram or Twitter. Make sure you're, you're following him. I do. And it's and he, does, he doesn't waste your time. I mean, you, you met him. I mean, he's, he just he goes right to the point. All right. So now here's the deal. This is not just in Michigan. It's in Colorado. I'm working right now with um, with with families trying to get the government to inform them when they're educating their children about transgender ideology, meaning when they're having an art class with an LGBT activist paid to come in and tell your 11-year-old daughter she's really a boy and uh, give her a, you know, a wristband and a special chat thread and supportive community and an LGBTQ flag, you as a parent need to know when the evangelist is coming to convert your child's gender so that you can opt maybe out of the class. Believe it or not, we're fighting for the right in Colorado to have parents informed in the school system. So so go on with the story here with um, what's happening in Michigan. And evidently the school system is in the business of persuasion. They're not trying to pursue neutral ground, are they? The left isn't trying to be get along and avoid culture wars, are they? No, they are evangelists as well. And think about how insane this all is, is we're saying a very a reasonable proposition here that a school system or teachers, if they want to talk to young girls about duct taping their chests, well, maybe you should get the parental notification and parental uh, admission first. And, and school says, uh, no, we're just going to usurp this. But that's what the left is doing. The left is after our kids. I don't. I mean, if you're a Christian and address kids still in government schools, I don't know why. Uh, but if you do, you certainly should be involved in making sure that this isn't coming to them and in their classroom. But uh, to bring it back to our first segment is when you have these Christian leaders like John Maxwell and others who say, "Oh, you don't want to talk about politics from the pulpit now." You may, you know, you may upset the congregation or congregational rifts. You just want to talk about Jesus. Okay, fine. You talk about Jesus. You have a conversion. Someone now accepts Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. Now, what? What are you going to do about government schools and government teachers who are trying to trans kids behind their their parents' back? Do you say, well, you know, that's that's not a gospel issue now. I can't, you know, I can't talk about that. I can't, I can't deal with that. That is divisive. Or, or do you take it now a moral stance and say that? as this new nature, as this new creation, no, I have an obligation, I have an ethical duty to ensure that I'm loving my neighbor properly. And loving my neighbor means not transing his, his kid, his kid behind his back uh, and setting them up for irreversible surgeries. We have a cultural war in this country for a reason. You have states like California, Minnesota, New York is on the cusp of, of creating what are called these transgender sanctuary laws. 
where not only do they provide this, uh, you know, these irreversible transgender surgeries, but they're like a safe haven. So if like you have Texas or some other red state that has banned the procedure, they're like, no, come here. It's almost like they want to lure kids over to their state uh, to ruin the, 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 their lives forever. So should Christians not talk about this from the pulpit? Should Christians not talk about this at city council meetings and even get upset and have a righteous indignation? Because Lance, I could be wrong, Lance, but I remember this guy, uh, I think his name was Jesus. He said something about uh, if you corrupt one of these little ones, speaking of pigs, it would be better if what? You put a millstone around your neck and you took a cold plunge into an ocean? Because that's the type of evil we're dealing with here. And, 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 Christians need to know the score. All right, so let's 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 analyze this a little bit further here. These are smart people. I mean, the uh, the, the the folks, the Maxwells and the Warrens. They're they they remind me in a way of, um, and we don't have time really to talk about this. But you know, there was two generations of testing that went on in David's kingdom, and I think it was T. Austin Sparks or some old time preacher. I was reading his sermons. He said that Abiathar the priest had accurately and faithfully stayed with David during the rebellion of Absalom. He led the kingdom and the government into a righteous alignment in one generation. But the test became more sophisticated the second time. And it looked as though David was old and out of touch with reality and in the rest home, and that Adonijah, the next one to get in power, was ready to be suited up and put on the throne. And Abiathar was persuaded by the influential peers that were around him that for the sake of the kingdom and stability, he should participate in uh, endorsing Adonijah. The only problem was David had said Solomon would be king, not Adonijah. And in the Middle East, if you're not in the lineage, you get killed off. So that would mean Bathsheba and Solomon would be killed. And Solomon is, as you know, the, the symbol of the wisdom of God coming out of our errors and mistakes, as David and Bathsheba had. It would be like killing off the wisdom that would prosper your future because you were persuaded for what sounded like good reasons to make a bad decision. Abiathar was the priest who passed the first test and flunked the second. And that's as kind and as biblical a metaphor I, I can make for the leaders in my generation whose books are on my shelves, whose guidance I have submitted to, who are making a great mistake. They passed previous tests. They are failing this one, and America is at stake. And they're, they're christening something which sounds like wisdom, but they're actually killing the wisdom of God. Because this is the hour when the left knows, but by attacking Christian nationalists, they're giving us a label, and our side is confused on it. Friends of mine I was with on Flashpoint recently said, oh, I'm a, I'm a Christian nationalist. And I say, well, I don't want to use the label they're using because I know what they're doing. What they do is they label in order to fix and polarize, and then they smear and brand, and then they poison the mind of people against the name. And our people, Christians, sincere Christians that listen to this confusion out there in the marketplace, they might not show up and vote. They might feel like, well, I'm not going to get involved with the, I'm not going to get, I'm just going to pray and focus. Whatever God's going to do, God's going to do. And it's not, I'm not going to affect it one way or another. The danger is if we have anything less than 81% showing up, this is the data we know. We need 81% of those that have a sound mind to push past the branding of Christian nationalism, the slander, the smear, the fear, the propaganda, the poisoning. You have to not drink it. You have to stay clear in your head and still pull that lever all the way down line for your school board to keep the trans community from converting other vulnerable kids. Even if you take your kid out of school, what are you letting the community get into that's going to conspire against your little Christian chartered school and shut it down? So, Jason, that's how I look at it. I think biblically, yeah, these guys have uh, they've earned the right to be respected, but they need to be called out for an Adonijah moment. Yeah, they're, they're living in a different time period in their minds. We yeah. no longer have this neutral playing field, right? There's, 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 there was because of a Christian consensus, but now we have a hostile playing field, and there's someone's worldview, someone's morality is going to be driving public policy. 
And all we're, we have the, the right and we have the responsibility and civic duty as Christians under our constitution, right? Our Caesar, right? To go ahead and uh, make our voices heard. We, we have protests that we're seeing in Cuba going on right now. Hundreds of people taking to the streets because they're tired of the food shortages or the rolling blackouts and the political subjugation. They're saying, down with communism. I've been to Cuba and seeing the oppression firsthand, it, it is, then when you come back, you realize how much you take for granted with just being able to go to the ballot box and say, you know what, this person may not be perfect, but it, his worldview pretty much aligns with mine and I'm going to support it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my case why I support him. And we have far too many pastors who, uh, who have the pulpit and they're going to act as uh, cowards in that process by not saying, hey, listen, you know, we may have two candidates who are, are who are faulty in many ways and have character flaws, but guess what? We're not dealing with candidates here. We're dealing with administrations. And one administration will protect your religious liberty. They, they will not try to trans your kids behind your back. They will try to keep taxes low and have a limited scope for government and try to uh, uphold the constitution. While the other one is going to macromanage every area of your life from telling you what type of car to drive, to banning your gas and stoves, uh, from trying to tell adoption agencies that those, this is what the Biden administration is doing now, telling adoption agencies that if a LGBT kid uh, is placed in a home, the parents must abide by every single one of his wishes, even if it means his irreversible surgery. It is a complete usurpation of the jurisdiction and power of family by the left, and it is currently represented by the Biden administration. It's not really a hard choice. It shouldn't be a hard choice for any Christian today. You know what the, the score is. You know what the scale is. Go ahead, voice your uh, your opinion, lay out the case uh, to your you know to, to the people in your church. And if some people leave, so what? If there's a congregational rift over the right reason over supporting biblical truths, so what? It's like these people lack faith, Lance. It's like they're so afraid. They think that their power and prestige or the numbers are going to dwindle out of their church because they say something controversial. So what? Your numbers dwindle. Do you have faith in God that God's going to well, restore those numbers or bring the right people or which, bring the quality right, to you? And, and the truth of the matter is, and I, and I think we need to probably be intentional about this. I used to be a church growth consultant before I ended up pastoring and found out uh, how that works. The the reality is churches that make the transition to being strong, articulate, courageous, moral individual, you know, voices grow because the people that are waffling aren't meeting the market demand for clarity on subject matter. So if you are clear in your pulpit about these things, the Pew Research Center says there's a new phenomena. Christians are choosing their churches based upon their politics more than ever before. What does it tell you? It tells you that the divide's already happening. Those that are that, that are out of touch are looking for churches that won't bother them, and those that are looking for the voice of truth are finding churches that aren't afraid to discuss political reality. One final thought. I heard a guy in an interview uh, that uh, I was on. You know, sometimes you're on the show and you listen to another speaker and it's like, aha, the light goes on. He said the mistake the church has made is because it didn't embrace clear morality teaching the Bible, which is a moral book. The government took all the moral issues and wrapped them up in political garb. So now sex, abortion, gender, uh, debt, immigration, instead of these being Christian issues that we have uh, ethics on, they're now political issues the church shouldn't talk about. So when the church is saying, stay out of politics, they're staying out of morality, which is the fundamental domain of the church. We gave it to the government because we didn't stand strong. And now we're actually preaching against being involved with politics, which is throw your hands up on all morality. Now you are ready to be trodden underfoot of men, which is what Jesus said would happen to a church generation that has no salt or flavor. Make sense? I, w I went over. Final thoughts, though, Jason. I'm going to go give you the final wrap up here. Uh, well, if we know that our politic, we have a political dysfunction culture today. It is it is politically a mess? And if we can see a dysfunctional culture, it's amazing to me that people would say, "No, we don't. We don't want Christianity in that. We don't want." If you look at the political mess we're in today, it's the first place you think you would want Christian principles embedded 
to go ahead and clear that and bring a level of morality and truth to it. So we just need more bold leaders and we need more people listening to your show and others like it to get the encouragement and the ammunition to go ahead and advance. I hate the term Christian nationalism. Well, it's, it's re- basically how it's defined. Every every Christian is a Christian nationalist, but it's worked all about the kingdom. And this is one way about advancing the kingdom. Politics is one small way, one small sliver in God's kingdom, but it's still part of God's kingdom. The, the, just, the government just, just is accountable like, to God. Just yeah, like the education. government is accountable to God. Edu- education and education, family. government, and family. Government. Folks, you can't surrender those domains. You're going to surrender your children. Standing for Freedom Center, that's where you can read Jason's work. Previous writing, get all of his articles. This is the moral case for embracing polarization, Jason Matera. You can follow him on Instagram and on Twitter, M-A-T-T-E-R-A. Thank you, Jason. We're going to have you back again in the near future. God bless you. We're entering a period of time that has increased hostility against people of faith. It's a time when Christians are going to be tested on a moral, physical, psychological, and even a financial basis. I'm here to remind you that God is the one who has blessed you thus far, and he will take care of you in the future. You have a divine responsibility, however, to see trouble and prepare yourself. For example, with record inflation eating away at the value of the U.S. dollar, The savings in your retirement account is in danger of slipping away. I recommend diversifying your 401k or IRA out of paper assets and into physical gold. And the best way to do that is with a gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. And that includes no penalties, there's no taxes, when you transfer current retirement funds into Birch Gold. To see how it works, I want you to go to lancewalla.com forward slash Birch and get your free info kit, and you'll be glad that you did. Did you enjoy this latest episode? Please remember to share it with your friends because the more knowledge you have, the better equipped you are to navigate the world.